Do you know what creation is? Anything that is created is called creation. And the Bible says the entire creation is waiting for believers to show up. What that means is that all of these things we see around is waiting for people who are filled with the spirit of God to come take over. Now this thing right here is creation. Now if creation is waiting for me, it means that this thing right here has a voice. If you're a man, you might not catch this revelation. But women knows exactly what I'm talking about. You ever walk and you're like, I'm just doing window shopping. You get to the window and you see a dress and you can hear the dress saying, come inside, come inside, come inside. Dress talks. Dress talks. Oh, man, you can see a shoe in the window and you can see a lady starting to change her walking because she sees herself already in a shoe. Shoes talk. I can tell you some men can see a car and enter into depression for six months. Oh, you don't know? Let me tell you something. There was a king in Israel. I believe it was King David. There was a poor man in his neighborhood who owned a prime land. He was so desperately desirous of having that land. And he thought, as a king, anything I want, I should have it. He went to the man and said, hey, guy, poor man, I want your land. I will give you good money for it. And the man said, shut up. I don't sell my land. Man, that thing hurt the king so bad. He became so depressed. He stopped eating. He stopped drinking. He went sleeping. He wouldn't even come out. That was how depressed David was because he wanted a land. That a poor man that he thought he could just buy him off. That poor man snubbed him and said, I don't want your money. I'm not selling my land. I want my dignity. You're not going to entice me with your money. In our neighborhood, we have a lot of Jewish people going around making all kinds of offers just to kick people out, uh, out of their neighborhood. We have gentrification all over the city. Why is it happening? Because they want to kick people out of certain places and make sure that certain colored people are not in certain areas. And because we are also so poor in our mindset, thinking that the more of paper you have called money, the richer you are. The poorest person is not a person without a dime or nickel. The poorest person is a person without a vision. So I refuse for you to buy me out. Bible says his wife went to him and said, why are you not eating? I've been cooking all the food is in the fridge. Why are you not eating? He said, I wanted to buy that land. And that crazy guy around the block said, he's not selling it to me. He was crying like a baby. So I know how a man who wants iPhone 15 can be depressed because they can't afford. And the phone is talking to them. Hmm. Somebody say, Lord, help me. Bible says, do not despise small things. And he's talking about the small money you claim is small. With small things, you make big things. I remember one man of God came to our former church, the pastor I used to, the church I used to pastor in the Bronx. And when he mounted a pulpit, that was his first time walking in there. He said, I love it when people do small things in big ways. He said, your church is so small, but it's like a five-star church. I'm not waiting to get into tomorrow to now model tomorrow. I'm modeling myself into my tomorrow. The life I'm living right now, I'm living it for the future. I'm not waiting for tomorrow. I'm not waiting for some big box before I become financially disciplined. I want to be disciplined right now. I want it to be my habit. I want it to be my nature. I want it to be my character. If I cannot manage $100 in that same way, when $1,000 come, I will mismanage it. And I got good news for you. God is looking for people that know how to manage. God gives his stuff to managers. Not Holy Ghost filled people. I need you to understand why there are more unbelievers with wealth. More than believers. Because God doesn't look for believers to bless. Those of you in my management class yesterday, we dealt with that. Prayer doesn't bring promotion. Fasting doesn't bring promotion. Management brings all that. Bible says when God created the heavens and the earth, he did not allow it to rain. Why? Because there was no man. 
to till the ground. It means all activities were stopped because there was no manager in place. God is looking for managers, people that will manage his stuff. People that will manage his property. That is what managers do. How well are you managing that which God has given you? You are sitting at Dunkin' Donuts every morning. And we're going to get into that. Some of you are wondering why this table is here. I'm going to teach you real practical stuff. Because some of you are like, you know, I don't even know where my money goes. I don't spend anything. I'm not that kind of person drinking and buying, you know, six pack and all that. I'm going to show you where the money is. We're going to go find it. We're going to go find it. We're going to find it because we become a disgrace to God. You tell me that my God in his place where he dwells, the streets are made of gold and you are still struggling and living in a shack? That is not a God we serve. That's not a God. And it's management, being responsible for the resources of God. I want to see people listening to me buying homes. Alex, you could buy a home. And you could buy homes. Glory to God. Yes. Amen for real. God wants us to represent the kingdom. If it's a kingdom of love, then we must show that indeed we are coming off that kingdom. You know, I shared with you recently that there is a big difference between being in a kingdom and being in a democracy. In a democracy, we elect the leader. Do you realize that we elect the president? So the power is in the people. In democracy, that is what we do. But in a kingdom, it is the king that elects the subjects. In fact, we don't make Jesus king. He was born one. <laughs> we don't vote him to be king. He is born as king. And that is why he looked at the disciples and said, you didn't choose me, I chose you. And so when you live in a democratic and capitalist economy, you might quickly forget the principles of the kingdom. And if we are truly from the kingdom, you would understand one thing. What makes a king powerful is how well his people are living. Oh yeah. That is why those days they will go to war, they will take slaves, they will take all their, their goodies, they will take all their property because the more of that you have as a king, it reflects in the lifestyle of your people. So if God is powerful, it must reflect in your life. And I'm not preaching materialism. I'm not preaching any of the things you might be thinking of because the Bible says we are born again. We are on our way to heaven and God is not expecting you to live in poverty to wait to get to heaven and walk on the streets of gold. He says when you pray in Matthew chapter 6 verse 9 to 12, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It means I got to have a replica of heaven on earth. It means that if the streets are made of gold, I got to have a reflection of that in my life. It means that even though I'm born again on my way to heaven, I must have heaven on earth whilst I'm working my way into heaven. I don't have to wait to get to heaven to enjoy heaven. I got to enjoy heaven whilst I'm on earth. Let your will be done. Let your kingdom come. Oh, glory to God. He says, let it be just as it is in heaven. Mm. So he says, do not despise your little paycheck. In that paycheck is the money for that big vision you are thinking of. Or oh, you should speak to all the great people in, 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 in the world today. There, there are so many billionaires in the world. In fact, 10 of them, out of the 10, 8 of them are in America. Eight of them are right here in America. And if you listen to most of them, a good number of them will tell you that, you know what, they began either from the garage or from some weird place. I was reading about Elon Musk, who is worth about $180 billion. This kid was born in South Africa. South Africa. And his half-parent brought him somewhere. Yeah, he started going to school at UPenn in Pennsylvania. Later on, he transferred and, and did some electrical engineering, engineering and physics. It wasn't even about education. It's about passion. That is why when you're a child of God, you should even draw a line between your job and your work. Your job is what you go to school for, right? But your work is what you are born with. Your job is what you are hired to pay and paid for. But you see, your work is what God places as a passion in your heart. 
You can be fired from your job, but nobody can take your work away from you. Nobody can take your work. That is a passion God placed in your heart. Me and my friend, we, we went to school to learn accounting. Later on, he went into marketing and I took accounting to another level. But now he has a cleaning business and he's passionate about it. Just like mom, she has a doctorate degree in nursing, but she's passionate about cooking. Sometimes I ask, are you going to put this nursing on the side and just cook? And she dared to tell me yes. I said, huh? <laughs> that is passion. You see, you can retire from what you went to school to do, but you don't retire from your work. And I love this because the Bible says God blesses the work of our hands. To, to those of us that think that once I pray, I can go to sleep and God will drop something out of the sky for me. No, he says, I will bless the work of your hands. It means if that blessing is upon your hands, your hands got to do something. God doesn't bless laziness. Your hands got to do something. Ask somebody, what is your hands doing? <laughs> <laughs> mm. one of the things God wants you to know is that whatever money God gives to you there is a way to spend that money and that's one of the things I want to share with you today because some of us don't know how to spend the money that comes into our hands every money, $10, $20, $50, $100 it got to be accounted for I feel so sudden when people are so excited. You can't believe it. This cover just approved me for $5,000. $5,000. Sis. Sis. $5,000. You won't believe it. I walked into Macy's. God is so good. Macy's. They just approved me $3,500. You don't realize that is a bait. It's an invitation for captivity. <laughs> invitation for slavery. And you call that a miracle. You call that a breakthrough. When God in his word says that the borrower is a slave to the lender. Did God call you into slavery? He says the borrower is a slave to the lender. It means, you know what? There is a modern form of slavery. I'm going to get these black and brown people to be having this crazy appetite for craziness. I will let them buy cars they can't afford, clothing they can't afford, shoes they can't afford. I'm going to make them buy homes they can't afford and I'm going to make them work. Do you know how many people have bought homes they can't sleep in it? Because if they sleep in it, the mortgage can't be paid. They can't be out there working all their life to pay for a home they never sleep in. And paying off the vacation of the CEO of that bank that gave him the plastic card. And that CEO is having a good time in Florida with his girlfriends. And a child of God who is the borrower has been enslaved. And he's the one financing the lifestyle of that man. Say, Lord, help me. We're going to learn some things that will help you. God wants to set you free. He wants to deliver you. Glory to God. He wants to set the church free. The devil is a liar. He's not going to have us. We will not be enslaved. Now, God wants you to be a man and a woman of God that thinks about assets. You know, back in school, we learned all kinds of things about assets and liabilities. We, we were taught that an asset is anything that is tangible, anything that um, appreciates and depreciates, if you will. And uh, we were taught that assets are like, you know, cars, like homes and buildings and what have you. But I want to keep this simple. An asset is anything that puts money in your pocket. Can we say that again? An asset is anything that puts money in your pocket. So begin to look at all the things you've put your money to. Are they putting money in your pocket? Try to visualize your closet right now as I talk. All the things in your closet, are they bringing money into your pocket? If it's not, it's not an asset. The car you bought, $60,000, you're paying notes on it, $850 every month. Is it bringing money into your pocket? Not an asset. 
In fact, it's a proven fact that the moment you drove that car out of the dealership, it lost value. So that can't even be an asset. You were all crazy. You're like, man, that car looks like a beast. You should see that car. Men have a way of, you know, describing it. And they will spend hours in a car washing place. After they've done washing, they have their own special, you know, things they do with a the car. They spend more time with a car than their wives or girlfriends or whatever. They have all kinds of lubricants, shine the tires, the wheels, and polish the dash, you know, uh, buy all kinds of deodorant and vacuum, special vacuum, handy portable vacuum that goes into the uh, crevices of the, of the seats. People do crazy. They spend more time cleaning that car than they will spend cleaning themselves. <laughs> oh Lord help us hmm. and so here you are think about all the shoes think about all the suits I remember many years ago I met a friend he was actually a pastor he said he had 52 odd suits he said one for every week I said, you are powerful. <laughs> That's all I could tell you. I said, you are powerful. <laughs> Oof, 52 suits. I couldn't comprehend that. You know, in Africa, we say, I can't think far. I, couldn't, I just couldn't think far. <laughs> wow. Hmm. Now, I want to tell you one thing about God, just so you understand. When I was growing up, myself and this friend of mine, we took a course called economics. We had some powerful economic teachers. And in Africa, whatever you are taught, the only way you pass is to memorize. I, I can tell you this is over 30 years, but I still remember verbatim the definition of economics. We were taught that economics is a social science. That studies the human behavior as a relationship between ends and scarce means, which have alternative uses. If I ask him, he can't say it. <laughs> I'm just messing with him. He tells Pauline all kinds of stuff, and I have to back it up. He tells Pauline that when we were young, we used to go ice skating. And I'm not like ice skating in Ghana, in Africa. <laughs> And then Pauline will call me, is it true? My dad says, when you were young, you used to go ice skating. <laughs> and not to make him look back or lie, I say, you know what? I can't remember. Let me call my mom and ask her. <laughs> <laughs> Praise God. But it's so interesting when you think about it. We are taught that man has unlimited wants. We learn that in economics, that if anybody in this room, and those of you out there, if you were asked, what are your wants? The list is inexhaustible. I want this. I want that. I want this. I want that. I want this. Please understand one thing. God is not a want-meeting God. He's a need-meeting God. That is what the book of Philippians chapter 4 verse 16 says. My God shall supply all my wants. No. Oh, my needs. According to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. So if you think that any crazy thing that goes across your mind, God got to deliver. No, that is not a God you worship. And some of us are frustrated because God never answered our wants. He never guarantees to answer our wants. He says, I will supply all your need. And economics will tell you what your needs are. It's called the basic necessities of life. Food on the table. Roof over the head. Clothes on your back. He guarantees that. And clothes on the back doesn't mean it has to be designer. Man, recently we traveled somewhere. I don't remember somewhere. We went, the entire family, we were there. And I'm like, somebody said, that place is very cheap. They have an outlet. When I got there, I realized that everybody had their own definition of cheap. I said, this is what you call cheap. Oh yeah, let's go. This is not our type of cheap. Cheap, this is cheap. They had dresses for $2,500. $2,500 for a dress I'm going to wear. I 
are saying that is mortgage on the mannequin. Mortgage on the mannequin. I rebuke you, devil. You, this mannequin, you are carrying mortgage. That's a mortgage sitting on a mannequin. <laughs> it's just like that little boy that went out to play and, you know, um, he came back crying, Mom, I can't find my, uh, what do you call that thing? My contact lens. Crying. Mom screamed on him, go back, you better go find it. He was out there five minutes, he comes back, Mom, I can't find it. He said, what do you mean by you can't find it? Go back and find it. He went three times, came back, couldn't find it. Mom said, where were you playing? Show me where you were. Mom goes there, within 30 seconds, she picks the eye contact. Why? Because mom didn't go looking for eye contact. He went looking for $750. <laughs> the boy went looking for eye contact. The mom went to look for 750 